Well, we are starting a brand new series this, this week called Overcomer. And basically what we're talking about is those things in our lives that can hold us back from living the kind of life that God has called us to, from us living the kind of life that, that God has wired us for and, and, and made us and designed us to be all that we can be. And there are just some things that happen in our lives that can just stop us from doing that. And those are the things that we have to overcome. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about overcoming apathy. We're going to be talking about overcoming labels. We're going to be talking about overcoming fear. And today, we're going to talk about overcoming comparison. Because if we don't get through those things, then we can't be exactly who God has you know, made us to be. And I just want to be upfront and transparent and honest today and tell you that I have a tendency to be a one-upper, okay? And I don't know if you know what a one-upper is or not, but these are people who, when you tell a story, they always seem to have a better story than you. Or if you're going through something, they've gone through something even worse than what you have. The Urban Dictionary puts it this way. An annoying person who responds to hearing someone else's experience or problem by immediately telling a similar story about themselves with a much more fantastic or terrible outcome. And then I saw a meme the other day that said this. It said, it said that my child is better than your child in everything, every time, everywhere, <laughs> forever. <laughs> And my guess is you probably know some of those kind of people. Maybe you have a hint of that one upper in you, in you also, you know? And it's understandable because we don't want to be less than anybody else, do we? We want to feel important. We want to make a difference. We want that kind of our lives to matter. And so as we look at other people, we, we, we kind of start comparing ourselves and seeing how we're doing, how we're stacking up. And there's never been a time in, in, in history that has been so much easier to compare yourself with other people because our lives are so transparent. Our lives are so much all over the place on social media that it's very easy to see how you stack up what is going on in your life compared to what's going on in other people's lives. And you know how this whole thing goes. Someone buys a new car and you think, oh my gosh, they got a new car. They're building a new house. How are they able to do that? You know? And then, and then you see a picture of them eating at, you know, someplace like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. And I'm looking through my, my cup in my car just seeing if I've got enough change to go through McDonald's thinking, you know, I don't know. And you start comparing yourself. You think, what in the world? And then you look and someone's on vacation again. You think, didn't they just go on vacation? And, and then they have the gall to be at a beach somewhere. And, you know, they take one of those pictures, you know, where all you see is their feet and the ocean out there, Lisa Levy. And... And, and you just think, my life really does suck, you know? It's just kind of the way it is. It's so easy to, to get into that comparison thing where, where you're looking all the time of what is going on in someone else's life, and do they have it better than what I do? Ladies, you know that you do this, even when it's not social media and you're walking through the grocery store, and you see that lady who's out there shopping in her high heels, her Gucci bag and all that stuff, and you're in your pajamas and you're wondering, you know, baseball cap and thinking, well, and you, don't you size her up and you make a decision and, and judgment right there, don't you? Or how about us? We pull up to the stoplight and someone pulls up with their Maserati. And you say, well, I know why they have that, you know. We make all these decisions. We make all these things. And it doesn't stop there because we look at our kids also and the sporting events that they play in, the sports leagues, and the way they get their grades in their schools, and we're hoping that our kids are stacking up to everybody else's kids. It's just there, isn't it? We're constantly looking over our shoulder and wondering, how are we doing in life? Are we, are we where we're supposed to be? How do we get up to everybody else? And I want you to understand that comparing ourselves to others does one of two things. It either makes you feel inferior or it makes you feel superior. And neither of those things honor God. And Pastor Craig Rochelle puts it this way. He says that where, wherever comparison begins, contentment ends. And it is so true, isn't it? Wherever comparison begins, contentment ends. And, you know, we can beat ourselves up over this, but I tell you what, even the disciples had issues with this. And they had to battle through this whole thing. You know, there's just some pieces of Scripture in, in Luke chapter 9. 
talks about the disciples. It says, then his disciples began arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Luke chapter 22, then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. They even had the same type of issues. James and John asked Jesus, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in your places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. There's this natural tendency for us to want to be ahead, to want to be important, to want to be, show everybody that we have this place of honor, don't we? And then there's this great interaction between actually Peter and John in, in Scripture. And I just kind of want to walk through this story a little bit. And, and Peter and John, you know, Peter is this really bold person, you know? And, and there's some competition apparently between John and Peter. And, and John, who is a little bit annoying because he likes to talk about himself in the third person. You know, he talks about he's the, the one, that, the disciple that Jesus loves. And he talks about himself being the other disciple and things. So let's just pick this up in John chapter 20. Jesus has been crucified. Here it is, John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple... John, the one whom Jesus loved, goes on. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Listen to this. Peter and the other disciple, John, started out to the tomb, for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. This is the first time that John wants us to know that he outran Peter to the tomb. He stopped and looked back in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived. Guys, in case you missed it the first time, I beat Peter, okay? And he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who reached the tomb first, third time... <laughs> Are you getting the, the image that, that John wants us to know that he's faster than Peter? Also went in, and he saw, and he believed. It's interesting, isn't it? How he writes this, and he makes sure that we understand that he beat Peter to the tomb. Maybe there's something going on, a little competition between the two of them. And then the very next chapter, the disciples are out fishing. They know Jesus has been raised from the dead, and they're out here fishing, just kind of killing some time, and they see someone on shore, and this person on shore tells them to cast their nets on the other side, and they do that, and all of a sudden, they realize that this is Jesus. John chapter 21, then the disciples loved, then the disciple Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work jumped into the water and headed to shore. The other stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. John stays in the boat, but Peter jumps out and starts swimming. So apparently, John may be faster on foot, but he realizes that Peter is faster swimmer than him, so he stays in the boat. But there's this competition thing that is going on. But the story doesn't end right there. And I want to give you just a little backstory. You know, before the crucifixion, we know that Peter was this bold individual who, who, who spoke, did things, you know, just instantaneously on, on, on feeling, then, and he spoke very boldly. He actually told Jesus, I will never deny you. No matter whatever happens, all these others around me may fall away, but I will not do that. And Jesus tells them that you will deny me three times. And so <laughs> Jesus has a conversation as, they, as Peter swims in, and, and Jesus is actually cooking these fish on the, on the beach, and he has a conversation with Peter after all of this happens. And he looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter answers, yes, I love you, Lord. And Jesus says, go feed my sheep. Then he asks Peter another time, so Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus tells him to go feed my sheep. And then the story tells us that one more time, Jesus looks at Peter and says, but Peter, do you love me? And it says that Peter is actually hurt. And I think it's interesting that Peter denies Jesus three times, and Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And Peter, 
having his spirit crushed a little bit, hurt a little bit by Jesus asking him a third time. He says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Then it gets really interesting. John 21, verse 18 says this. Jesus speaking to Peter. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. After saying this, then Jesus told him, follow me. Feed my sheep and follow me. Listen to what Peter does right after this. Verse 20. Peter turned around and saw behind him the disciple that Jesus loved, John. The one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? And Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus just told Peter, feed my sheep and follow me. And Peter looks behind him and says, well, what about John, Jesus? What's he supposed to do? What is he supposed to do? Is he supposed to feed sheep also? What's he supposed to do about how he follows you? What about the death that he is going to to experience. What about him? Isn't that how we react at times? Is what about them? Peter is comparing himself to John. What about what's going to happen to him? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. Don't worry about him. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. I have something for you. I have a mission for you. I know how I have wired you. I know what you're, you are supposed to do. I know exactly where you're supposed to go. Just follow me. Don't worry about anybody else. Your mission is your mission. This is your calling. Don't let anybody else get in your way. Don't let anybody else stop you from doing what I have called you to do. You are just to follow me and feed my sheep. We cannot faithfully follow Jesus if we are comparing ourselves to somebody else. As you look around and see how anybody else is fulfilling their calling, is, is chasing Jesus, and you start comparing yourself with them, you're in for a problem because you have your own calling. It's different than anybody else's. You are specifically and uniquely wired for something that only you can do. And God is saying, let's do it together. Just follow me. Don't worry about everybody else. It's about you and your calling and where I am asking you to go. That's what we have to be concerned about. Don't compare your calling to somebody else's. Do what only you can do. And for us as a church, it's the same thing. And this is one of those things that as I look around, I see what other churches are doing, whether they're big or whether they're small, and, and we can get caught up saying, well, look what they're doing. Great for them, man. We want them to be as, as, as productive as they can. We want them to be as successful as they can. But Jesus, God, has a calling for this church, for Crossfish Community Church, that we've got to be true to, that we've got to take this calling and do whatever we can to say, God, we want to hear you, we want to experience you, and we want to take you to others. What is our calling? Let's not look around. Let's do what Jesus is calling us to do, to transform lives by helping people take next steps with him. That is what we are to do. This church is wired uniquely. So as individuals and a group of people, a body moving together, we have got to zero in on what our calling is as individuals, zero in on what our calling is as a church. So we need to do whatever it takes to do what God is asking us to do. Find our calling. This is our focus. There's nothing else and no one else that is important. We ask ourselves, what will define our worth? What will define your worth? And if the answer is anything other than Jesus, then we are looking in the wrong places. 
if we are living for someone else's praises, if we are living for as many likes on our posts as we can get, of how many people we can get to follow us, then we've got a problem. Because the only thing that matters is what Jesus is calling us to do. And let's be as true as we possibly can. Who or what is bringing meaning to your life? I hope and I pray that that answer is nothing more than Jesus. And let's do everything we can to figure that thing out. In closing today, I just want to read another piece of scripture from Romans chapter 12. And here's what it says. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Let me read that last piece of scripture again, that last verse again. Worship team, if you want to come up, we're going to close. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Did you realize that you have a race that God has set before you? It's a race that he expects you to run. It's, ex- it's a race that he expects you to run and no one else. It is your own race. The question is whether you will choose to run that race. The so race may be in your family. <laughs> the race may be in your workplace. The race may be in some kind of way you volunteer. Whatever it is, God has got to set something in front of you to pursue wholeheartedly. And how do we do that? Verse 2 answers that. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Let's all today just run our race. Let's stop comparing ourselves to everybody else and just ask God, what is it you have for me? What is that one race that you have for me so that I can do it wholeheartedly? And I will not take my eyes off of Jesus who is going to not only define that, but give me every resource that I need to finish that race. We have a mission to accomplish. Let's do it with passion. Father, we are so thankful. It is amazing to me and to us that you would choose to use people like us to do whatever it is you're trying to do in our communities, in our workplaces, in our families, in our world. And so, Father, I just pray that you would make it evidently clear of what it is you want us to do. Help us to realize how we've been uniquely wired so that we can pursue what you have chosen for us. And let us do it with a passion so that we can see people fall desperately in love with you. It's in the amazing name of Jesus that we pray. You know, so often we look around at others and wonder that's where we get our worth and the only only place we need to look to see who we belong to what our worth is all about is jesus and that's what we're going to sing about so would you stand with us as we close today